We're in a series that is called Money Is. Money Is. We actually went on the streets. We're not going to play the video right now, but we went out on the streets and we just asked people, what, when you think of money, like what do you, what do you think money is? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. It says this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Could we say that line together? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, where your treasure is, for where your treasure is, for where your treasure is, in Spanish, what's the word, tesoros? Is that the word? It's where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, or if your eye is good, or if your eye is single, if your eye is healthy, your whole body's going to be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one, love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. Let's pray. Lord, help. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So I do a lot on my phone. And one of the good things about a phone is that you can, you can record things, you can carry things, you can take pictures of things, you can capture moments, you can do all sorts of things. The problem is I have a lot of children. So we have eight children. And uh, what that means is like one of the most dangerous meals in the world for us would be pancakes or waffles because they're syrup. Because somehow, I'm not sure how it happens, but when you've got eight kids, you'll find a way for syrup to land on this, I'm not sure if you can see, this part of my phone. So I'm going and trying to take pictures, and it doesn't matter how straight my camera is, or how good the angle is, or whatever it is that you do with your camera, if there is syrup on your camera, if there is syrup on the eyeball of your camera, all of your videos, all of your photos, all of your stuff is going to have issues because the eye is the lamp of your phone. And if there is syrup on your eye, oh, how great is the darkness in this phone? <laughs> See, what we're talking about today is Jesus said, if you've got bad eyes, everything's going to be bad. What he's actually getting at here is the eye is the lamp. If your eye is healthy, everything's going to be healthy. And if your eye is not... Everything is going to be jacked up, messed up. Everything's going to have darkness in it. If your eye is not good, if you, if you don't get this one right, everything else. See, see, when you've got bad eyes, you look at everything wrong. When you've got bad eyes, you don't know how to look at trials, and you don't know how to look at blessings, and you don't know how to look at family, and you don't know how to look at foes, and you don't know how to look at opportunities, and you don't know how to look at things that have been, been stopped, and you don't know how to talk to a waitress, and you don't know how to talk to your child, because when the eye is bad, it's got this trickle-down effect. Everything goes bad. You cannot have a good life, according to Jesus, without good eyes, according to Jesus. Now, Jesus is the one saying it. I'm, gonna re I'm just going to plagiarize Jesus right now, but I need you to know that if you've got bad eyes, everything is going to go wrong. <laughs> you know, we're, I'm about to talk about money, and the joke on our staff is that I sort of don't care about this, you know, because... Um, even a few years ago, we had a series that was on stewardship or something. And I'm like, ah, we just did it when I was on my summer study break because I'm like, I don't even, I don't even want to talk about it. I'm like, I, churches, they, they get obsessed with money. And, and usually when they're talking about money, it's something like, uh oh, we, you know, finances are bad. Guys, I, like, you know, I hope this doesn't demotivate you. Finances are not bad at our church, okay? Um, we need millions more dollars. But the reason we need millions more dollars is to go change the world. Um, but Ruthie's not about to come up. She's not about to have some mascara coming down her eyeballs and saying, you know, can you please help all the little patch children? All the little patch children are just fine. There's nothing I need. There's, our, our church wants to step out and do radical things for Jesus, but I'm talking about money right now, not because I'm desperate, not because we're desperate. Even the, the big takeaway of this is not going to be, hey, gang, can you give more to the church? I mean, I'm sure something like that could happen, but this is way bigger than money that you give to the church because as we're going to find, this is talking, your eyesight follows you on Mondays and Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays. And if you've got bad eyes, you're going to have a bad life, period. 
If you've got bad eyes, your marriage is going to stink, and your kids aren't going to be raised right, and, and you're not going to know how to go to work, and you don't take tests the same way. And, I mean, everything goes, when your eye is bad, your whole body, your whole life, your whole existence is full of darkness. Listen, man, some of you are about to get changed in this. There are some of you that have struggled with things for years, and you've got no idea why. And I'm telling you, man, some of you are going to shift over these next few, I'm going to dare some of you just to say, you know what, go and watch every single sermon in this series, and you are going to watch your life change, where you had bad eyes, blurry vision, and your eyes are about to get bright, and you're about to get voted best eyes in senior class. That's what's about to happen. <laughs> okay, what's the, here's, here's today's first sermon in this series called Money Is. And I need you guys giving me my, my clock because otherwise I'm going to preach for four hours. I need a clock that says only go two. All right? So here we go. Big idea today is simply this. Money is a great tool, but it's a terrible master. Money is a great tool, but it's a terrible master. If you make it a tool, you're going to get 20-20 vision and life is going to be sweet. If you make it a master, you're going to get blinded in ways that you've never even imagined. Money's a great tool. It's a terrible master. That's where we're going to go today. I want to give you, out of this passage that I've read, three, three indicatives and one imperative. Three things you need to know, one thing you need to do from this passage. Number one is this. The eye, this is indicative number one. The eye is the lamp of the body. Verse 22, Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is going to be full of light. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. God is light. God is bright. God's desire for you is that you would reflect him by, by showing forth light, by, by having light. If your eye is good, the eye is the lamp of the body. Let me say it in a different way. The eye is a cause, not an effect. It's a cause, not an effect. So one of my heroes is Dr. Perkins. John Perkins is one of my... Um, just, I don't know, kind of like a spiritual father, hero kind of figure. And um, a couple years ago, his, his daughter called me up and she said, hey, just, you know, Pastor Mike, be praying because um, daddy is, he's just very sick. We're, we're thinking he might be dying of cancer. And I was, I mean, I was grieving. And like, we don't know how long he's got, but he's just been sick and he's not been able to shake it and we don't know what's going to go on. And anyway, they were going through things. And as, as, you know, I was praying for him and we were doing all this kind of stuff. And when the next couple of weeks, I get a call back and she says, oh, great news. We found out he doesn't have cancer. He has mold in his closet and the mold in his closet is killing him. In other words, the cause of his problem was in his closet it was not in his body. Now, that's very good news. Now, friends, one of the tricks to life is being able to identify the cause, not just the effect. What Jesus is getting at here is when you've got good eyes, your whole life is going to be good. When you've got good eyes, there's going to be a trickle-down effect to the rest of your life. But when you've got bad eyes, even if you keep going to the doctor and treating the symptoms of what you thought was cancer, none of the treatment's going to help because you're dealing with an effect, not a cause. If you want to get rid of the problem, you don't deal with effects. You need to deal with the with the cause. So many of you guys might remember a few years ago, uh, Flint, Michigan, we've got this issue where there's all these children that are sick and all these people that are sick and all these people that have problems and they're going to the doctor and kids that have asthma and kids that are coughing all the time and, and children that are sick and families that are, that are in shambles and all these, and they keep on going to the doctor to treat the symptoms. Does anybody remember what the actual problem was? It was the water. In, in, in England, they'd say water. Everyone say water. It was the water. That's what it was, the water. So you can go and you can watch. You could treat the symptoms, but that's just the effect. But the cause was the water. Now, Jesus, I'm telling you guys, listen, you got to catch this. Because even when it comes to money, people are like, oh, don't deal with money. The problem is 15% of all of Jesus' teaching was about money and possessions. 15%. Okay, the, the joke on our staff is Mike never wants to talk about it. The problem is when we do counseling with people, there's more counseling related to money problems than just about anything else. So we're like, when, when we, people go to breakthrough and they break through, but in breakthrough, I'm even rethinking what we do at breakthrough. We probably need to give people some idea what to do about their money because we've seen people break through on a Friday and a Saturday at a breakthrough. And then two weeks later, they're in shambles again because there are root money issues that have given them bad eyes. And if you've got bad eyes, you're going to have a bad life. Jesus is actually claiming your approach to money and possessions gives you your eyesight. 
Your eyes, according to Jesus, are a very big deal. In fact, this, this, even this phrase when he says, if your eye is healthy, Jewish people had a term. It was, it was an evil eye or a good eye. For example, the, there was a good eye and an evil eye. The, the Jewish idioms here are ayin tova, which would be a good eye, or ayin ra'a, which would be an evil eye. And the idea on this was this was a Jewish phrase to have a good eye. If someone had a good eye, it meant they had an open hand. If someone had a good eye, a good eye for hundreds of years in Judaism, when someone had a good eye, it meant if you saw a beggar, your hand was open. If you saw a person, your hand was open. It wasn't just opening of your pocketbook. It was an opening of all of you. It was when someone had a good eye. I think we've all seen what it looks like when, we've, when we, we see someone like, man, did you see the way she looked at me? And, and, and many of you have done that. You've looked at someone, you've even judged, you're assuming what they were doing because they were like, hmm, looking at you like this. And you're like, and, and it's, and you're like she was giving me the evil eye. The idea of an evil eye, it's, a, it's the eye is revealing the heart. This is why in, in, in Jewish scripture even, when God, the blessing of the Levites would be things like, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. It's a word that refers to even his eyes. Do you understand that when father looks at you, his eyes aren't evil, his eyes are good. One of the reasons many of us don't approach father's heart and we don't seek the face of the Lord is because we assume he's stingy with an evil eye. We assume that he's only got so much grace. We assume that it's not really amazing grace how sweet the sound that saves wretches like us. We assume that he's got a certain amount of grace and that maybe I've already exhausted it. But if only you knew that Father's eye towards you is good. It's healthy. That when he looks at you, it's like, you know, one of my girls was in service this morning. I'm not going to say her name so I don't have to pay anything. Actually, did I already do it? Do I already have to pay something? Oh, no. No. Well, then, I, then I'll say her name. When Arella was in service this morning, and I'm just looking at her, and I'm like, oh, I, if you could have seen my face when I'm looking at her, I'm like, that girl, I mean, she wakes up in the morning, and my heart bubbles. I adore this child. I just adore. Do you understand that Father adores you? I mean, you wake up in the morning, I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. D- d- do you understand? <laughs> this, this, is the, this is the ayin tova. This is the, the good eye. Now, G- what Jesus says now is, is this. He, he's saying, listen, this is, this, is way, this is way deeper than you think it is. We tend to think there's like all these different parts of our life that are all compartmentalized, okay? What Jesus is saying is your eye is not like your pinky. You can blow your pinky and the rest of your body can still be okay. You cannot blow your eye and the rest of your body's gonna be okay. Because when you blow your eye, you're walking and you stub your toe. When you blow your eye, you'll look at foods and you'll pick up the wrong food and you'll eat the kind of mushrooms you shouldn't eat. When you've got the wrong eye, you'll, you'll think it's just a, a bush or a leaf. And in, in fact, it's actually poison oak. When you've got a wrong eye, it will trickle down like water from Flint, Michigan. Into the, and what Jesus is saying is your eye is a cause. It's not an effect of problems and issues in your life. And your approach to money, which is what the evil eye was or the good eye was, your approach to money was a very big deal. In, in fact, there's, there's just like different mindsets people can have. I mean, for example, I'll just give you the, the there's, a, there's the mindset of, there's like a, a, a lack mindset, and then you can contrast that with, a, with an abundance mindset. When, when you have a lack mindset, and there's, and there's some of you that are listening to me now, even currently, you live in a poverty mindset. Even right now, you're living in a lack mindset. When you live in a lack mindset, you are tempted to believe that we serve a God or that we look at a world like ours and say, wait a minute, there are limited resources on this earth, which is true. When you're living in a lack mindset, you become like the Chinese government that says, oh, each family can have one child and no more because there's no space. We'll make you abort your child if necessary because there's no space. When you serve the God who is alive, who sits on the throne, God has seen fit to let us be in a world which is defined by limits so that we can invite him into our lives who is defined by the no limit God that he is. Which is why when a child comes and there's 5,000 people to feed and there's only one kid's bag, you know, one kid's got some Lunchables from Publix and that's all there is for 5,000 people and they say, wait a minute, we can't feed everyone because we're limited. He says, put it in my hands because I'm not. 
See, watch, watch. When you live in a limited, lacking, poverty mindset, you get your tax refund, and the first thing you got to do is go spend it all because you know what's going to... I mean, I've had people tell me this. I had to spend it because my family's going to come and hit me up, and if I don't hurry up and spend all my money and waste it on some stupid stuff, someone else is going to come and take it from me. There's only so much, so you better enjoy it quick while you got it. That's a lack mindset. When you got a lack mindset, you, hit, you get some food, you're like, man, you go to all you can eat buffet. That's why you'll find like you, maybe some of the seasons of your life when you had no money, you're like, how did I gain 50 pounds? Because you went to the all you can eat buffet and you were like, God knows, I better eat all I can. It's literally all you can eat. It's like, ugh, ugh, stuff in that thing. Because there's this idea like, uh-oh, what if tomorrow God stops keeping his promise and tomorrow he will not give us this day our daily bread? See, when, when you know that God is not lacking, you don't actually have to hurry up and stuff your face and, and, and get all of yours and hoard all your stuff. See, when, when someone's in that lack mindset, they, they, you, you have to scarf it down. You, you live in a mode of, of survival. You live in a mode of, well, it's just fate. I guess fate would have it that, that this is how. But when you live in a, in a mindset of abundance, you believe in the God who sits on a throne and says, I dare you to trust me who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I dare you to trust me that even if everything ran out like a Lunchables at a, at a feast of 5,000 people, I love when people dare me to show up in my abundance in the midst of their lack. When you sign up with Jesus, when you start to believe in Jesus, when you start to walk with Jesus, you have tapped into a new power source. It's like someone that was going on oil lamps and all of a sudden you've plugged into Gainesville Regional Utilities and you've got electricity. Do you understand what you've got in Jesus? Do you understand what you've got in your Father? Do you understand what happens when you pray, God, bring your kingdom on the earth as it is in heaven? Now I'm telling you, in this series, I'm pleading with God. I'm like, Lord, change our mindsets. I want our entire church to receive a, a spirit of abundance on you, that everywhere you go and everything you do, that something inside of you would say, wait, no, God is abundant, and there is nothing he holds back from his children. Nothing. Now, of course, we don't always live like this. I, I never buy good sunglasses because, just because. Because I lose things, I break things, all this. And so last year, Ruthie, she bought me, like, no, two years ago, she bought me some nice Ray-Ban, like $100 sunglasses. And I'm like, oh, man, oh, baby, take them back. Don't, don't do that. Like, no. She's like, she's like, no, if you've got nice, the reason you break them and lose them is because you've got cheap ones. You spend $5, of course, you're going to lose or break $5 things. And I'm like, no, just sure enough, I've had those suckers for two years. Because I do. I'm like, oh, no, I'm keeping those in the case, and these are good, and it is true. Like, you buy the cheap ones. Cheap ones are no different than Ray-Bans for, like, the first 15 minutes, you know? And then after that, they get scratched. It is true. It's totally true. Okay, I, I acknowledge it. A few, a few months ago, a couple months ago, we're doing something. I left them outside. We're doing something, and my children broke them. I was like, oh, I was despondent. I'm like, no, no. So we're getting ready to go to Italy. Ruthie bought me new ones. I'm like, no, don't buy me new ones. I told you, I'll break it. She's like, no, Michael, I, these lasted two years. I'm like, no, I'll just buy cheap ones. She's like, by the time you keep buying cheap ones, even if they only last two years, this is still a better deal. This is still a better deal. So she got me new ones. I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm, I'm still not, mm, $100 is a lot of money to spend on sunglasses. Well, two weeks ago, I lost them. I was playing beach volleyball, put them on a car, drove off. I don't know where they are. I don't know what happened to them. Man, guys, I don't know how to describe this. I don't know if you've ever been in this spot, but I got home. I was like heavy. Just, I'm like, oh, man. I mean, I, I'm embarrassed to tell her. I, inside, I'm like, oh, my, I'm, I'm so, fr it's like two hours later, I'm still frustrated. We're going to dinner, or eating dinner that night. I'm like, mm. I'm, I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm like unusually despondent about this. I'm in a bad mood. I'm, and I go over and, and Ruthie, and it's not, we're, she's, she can read anything I write and I can read anything she writes. She writes in a journal and all this kind of thing. But she, her journal was open on where she prays and it was just sitting there. And she had written something in her journal. She's like, Lord, it makes me so sad when Michael frets about money because 
it just ruins things in the whole house. Like, he's different with the kids, he's different with me. And, and, I, and I'm sort of summarizing this, but I, I immediately just shut. I'm like, oh, like it, it really grieved my heart. Because when your eye is bad, it changes the temperature of the entire house. When you're, see, see, my eye was, see, the, the eye being bad, it's not just an issue of being stingy. When your eye is bad, it's that you think he's stingy. When your eye is bad, it's that you're failing to realize you live in a kingdom of abundance where God takes care of his children. Where, which is, and I'm sitting here and I'm so frustrated, like, oh, why would, and I'm mad at me. I'm mad at, why did I, how could I do this? How, I, I feel like I'm letting Ruthie down. And, and here I am in my, and, and, I, and I'm fretting over $100, which is a lot of money, but I'm fretting over it. But watch, if you were to ask me, Mike Pats, is it worth $100 to not be there for your, your daughter? No. What about your other daughter? No. What about your other daughter? No. Your other daughter? No. Your son? What about, what about your, no? Is it worth, no, no, no. Is peace worth $100? No, peace is a gift from God. It is not worth fretting over. And I remember I closed it. And I was like, Lord, I do not want to lead my family like this. I don't want to lead a church like this. I don't, when, when something goes wrong, when you lose that something, when that issue happens, when, when the bill, you're not sure what's going to happen. See, what he says is the eye is the lamp of the body. We underestimate how core this is. This is a cause, not an effect. God will allow you to lose sunglasses, to get to the root of something, to recognize, wait a minute, God has a primary competitor on this planet, which is why he said, you cannot serve two masters. The only other actual master competition Jesus mentions is money, which is why to even suggest that you can have a spiritual life without touching your financial life is insane. See, this is a cause, not an effect. We, 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 keep, we seem to keep being surprised when we're looking at problems downstream. And guys, let, let, me just, let me make this clear. There are problems and symptoms that are downstream, and those are real. That boy's asthma in Flint, Michigan is real. That cough is real. Those digestive problems are real. Those cancers are real. But the cause is upstream. In church, right now, we are in a culture where there are so many effects that are real, okay? Divorce is real. Sexual issues are real. Racism is real. Injustice is real. But I'm telling you, if you take this upstream, what you're going to find is that there are roots upstream that are developing fruits downstream that you got to get to the roots. Because if you got bad eyes, you're going to have bad eyes, period. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. Stop being surprised when there are problems downstream that could be solved if you could just get the right eyes. Get money right and the trickle down is amazing. Number one, the eye is the lamp of the body. Number two thing you need to know. Number two, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's gonna be. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is a principle. Your heart always follows your treasure. Now, now this is very important. It, we, we tend to think that your money is going to follow your heart. Jesus says it's the opposite. Your heart actually follows your treasure. So I'm not a big softball fan, but there's, we have staff members that I love a lot that really like Gator softball. And so I was really getting into Gator softball. I don't know if any of you guys like Gator softball, so I was really getting into Gator softball. They weren't having the greatest season that there ever was, but then at the end, they were really pulling it together and we were playing Tennessee and there was like a walk-off hit and it was exciting and, and I'm texting people and I'm all like, I mean, like my heart was in to Gator softball. I'm like, oh my, this is sweet. Like, oh my gosh. And they, and they went to the, the College World Series. It was like, oh, it's like really, really cool. You know, go Gator softball. And I was, I was really, really excited about this. And then the Gators lost, and I could care less about softball right now. <laughs> I, I just, like, I, my heart, I mean, I'm not bothered by it. I'm not interested in it. I'm not following it. Like, when the Gators were in it, like, several times a day, sometimes I was checking on my phone what happened in the game, what's happening in the game right now. I'm not watching the game, and it was not there. You know, what's happening? In the, and I was, I was truly interested. But once the Gators were out, my heart wasn't even in it anymore. So I was reading this interesting Psychology Today article, and one of the things that it said was that when you give somebody something, it's weird. If you give someone something, your mind and heart 
look for evidence that you made a good investment. So when you share your stuff with somebody, when you share your possessions, when you give money away, you can't help it. You find yourself looking for the evidence that they're really good people. Like you go give money to someone, I mean, you, what you're gonna do is you're gonna be on the lookout like, mm, man, he, she, is a, man, she is a sweet lady. Man, that is a good dude. Why do you think that? I don't know. No, the reality of psychology today would tell you the reason you think that is because whenever you share your stuff with people, you can't help it. Your heart moves toward them. Which is why husbands, you don't wait till you feel it to buy the flowers. You go buy the flowers and you start to feel it. Your wife could have been like the biggest witch there ever was that morning, waking all the kids up. And that's how you're thinking. And you go buy some flowers and all of a sudden you're like, man, my woe man. You start walking in the door, you got flowers in your hand because you just spent money on these flowers. $3.99 at Publix they were. <laughs> you tried to take off the tag, but it wouldn't come off, so you go back and buy the... The only other option, $24.99 roses. <laughs> and you're like, oh man, I wasn't gonna, but you buy the roses and there was no reason for this. There was no reason other than the fact that you remember that psychology today told you what Jesus already said, which is where your treasure is, there your heart future tense will be. So you buy the flowers and the whole trip home, your heart can't help it. It's how God wired you. When someone has given themselves to something, they cannot help it. They become increasingly devoted to that something. Which is why when you were made in the image of the one of him who it is said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Before you were even born, he was already giving to you. Which means there's been 2,000 years a father's heart just devoted to you, moving in your direction. <laughs> Man, he just adores you. It's like, it's too late. He already started giving. It's just too late, which is why when you're stingy, what happens is when you've got an evil eye, when you won't give it, when you're stingy, it's really bad. When, which is why if you've had, watch, even if I've had a bad waitress or a bad waiter, if I just go ahead and give a good tip Anyway, I'm not giving a good tip because simply this is what they deserve. I'm giving a good tip because I'm made in the image of the God who is generous, and he has certainly tipped me in ways I did not deserve. So I'll just go to a restaurant and be like, I'm going to reenact the gospel right now. You deserve hell, and I'm going to tip you heaven. <laughs> you know, I remember when I became a Christian, Pastor Lassinger was preaching, and he preached a sermon right before I went away because I was a freshman at UF. And he was preaching on, on tithing, and I'd never known this, and so I'm, I'm working. He just said, you know, tithing is where you just take the first 10% and you give it to God, and it's out of your control. You, there's a lot of other offerings that you can do, but, but you just give that first 10%. And I remember I went away um, that summer, and I worked in a warehouse down in South Florida, and I would work 50 hours a week, and I was making very good money. And I don't know if you've ever had this issue, like you start making very good money, and like, Tithing is harder when you make a lot of money. You know, I'm a college student. I was making a lot of money. I was making like $8 an hour. I was like, man, I am rich. You know, that's how I felt. And, and I remember I was, I would send, I remember sending the first tithe check. And this is like, oh, this is, you know, the you know, church didn't have Venmo or something. I was sending it in an, you know, it's called an envelope. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. It's like an envelope. And, and I would lick it and I'd put my check in there and I would send these tie checks, and I, and I memorized, that's when I memorized the address of our old church, 2925 Northwest 39th Avenue, Gainesville, Florida, 32605. And I would send that, and I have to tell you, it was weird. Like, I was away for two months working, but all summer long, I was just longing to be back with my church family. Because your heart always follows your treasure. You, you just can't help it. You just can't help it. Which is why even sometimes when I've had conversations with people about, about money, like, well, Mike, I don't, I, don't give to, I don't give to our church. Are you concerned? I'm like, well, I don't even, I wouldn't know because I don't check anybody's giving. I said, the only concern I have is, well, clearly your heart's not here. And our dream is that we're going to have a family of people whose hearts are here. Because Jesus said where your, where your treasure is, that's, that's where your heart 
that's where your heart's going to follow. So this is why parents have a very easy time. It's kind of like a never-ending cycle, giving things to their children. You know, like they, they just give and they're like, man, I'm just so devoted to my, well, clearly, you know, because they keep giving. So here's the principle though. You need to understand, I, see, I'm tempted to think that money is just reflecting my heart, but money is actually moving my heart. Money will move you in ways that, I'll give you an example. This week I got a haircut and I was at the barber there was this, this little kid was in the chair and the little kid was in the chair and he's talking to the, and the lady's like, and he was like a chatterbox. He's like, man, I just, I, school just ended. I'm going to be doing summer school. And she's like, why are you doing that? I'm doing summer school because I didn't do good in school this year. And I don't know why I didn't go to good school. I, I don't even know why. I just, I have a hard time focusing. I don't know why I just can't stop focusing. I can't focus. And, I, and he's just going on. And she's like, oh, well, tell me more about this. Oh, I mean, English is hard. Have you ever taken, have you ever done, have you ever done algebra? Man, it's just so hard. It's just, and she, he's kind of going on and on and on. And, and bless this barber's heart. I mean, she's doing her thing. And he goes on and, and he's like, man, I'm about to do summer school. I guess I'm just, I guess I I just ain't that smart. And she's like, oh, no, I'm sure you're smart, you know. And she gets ready to go pay, and, and uh, his mom rolls up in a wheelchair to go pay for the, for the thing. And so this guy comes over, and, and she's about to pay, and, this, and so this other guy comes over, and he had a $100 bill. And he comes over, and he's like, hey, man, someone gave me this $100 bill, and I'm pretty sure this was for you. Like, I'm pretty sure this was for you. She's like, what, what do you mean? She's like, he said, would you let me, could I just give you this? Go ahead and pay. And turns out when, when, when the lady said the amount, the amount was like $40, which didn't make sense for the one kid's haircut. And, but get, you know, get, it was like $40 or whatever. He said, just give the woman, it was $36. Give the lady a good tip or whatever. And, um, and then you keep the rest of it. She's like, are you sure? He's like, hey man. And he says, Jesus Christ died on a cross, rose from the dead, loves me, put it in my hands. And I'm pretty sure this was for you, you know? And she's like, man. and so I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm in this barber shop where this, I'm like, man, the entire atmosphere of the barbershop shifted. The lady rolls out, little boy rolls out talking the whole time. And the barber says, you, you know why the bill was so much? It, she had to get her haircut too. She's got cancer and she's going through chemotherapy and it took 45 minutes to cut her hair to look like that. The little boy's having a hard time in school because she's been in cancer treatments and she's been absent. And, and, the, and the lady just sat there. She, she just sat there saying, so that was kind of cool that you felt like you were supposed to give that hundred bucks because I don't know. And, and it's like, the, it's like Paul, the entire barbershop was on pause watching this happen. And you could feel it move. Now, guys, I'm telling you, the same thing happens in your life. Your heart will be cold. Your heart could be hard. And God moves you. And usually, it watch, see, see, what greed does, greed screams. Fear screams. That's not what Father does. Father whispers. It's a still small voice. It's that voice that if you want to argue with them, it's always easy to argue and drown it out. But if you're willing to listen, what will happen is you'll find yourself pulling a $5 bill or a $20 bill or a $100 bill or paying someone's mortgage. And you did it because all God usually offers up front is a whisper. What we often want is a guarantee. He usually doesn't do guarantees. Faith is usually a whisper. But then you're like in the middle of signing it and tears come to your eyes. Or you're in the middle of giving it and you know this is gonna mean you're getting bologna sandwiches instead of going to Outback for lunch or whatever it is. And all of a sudden your heart moves and you have this sense inside like you were made for this. And what it is, it's the image of God come through. It's that image in who you were made and all of a sudden you start to reflect in, in your heart. It's like that barbershop. The, the barbershop goes, it's like, it was like watching the matrix and everything is on slow motion, you know? It's like pause. And it's like, everything is still. There's no one moving in the place. And, and the woman's sitting there, she's like, did you know she had cancer? Did you know what they're going through? And a whole place gets to hear Jesus. And the whole place gets moved. I'm telling you guys, is your heart hard? Get a good eye. Is your heart cold? Get a good eye. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Number three. Number three. No one get This is number one. The eye is the lamp of the body. It's a cause, not effect. Number two. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Number three. No one can serve two masters. 
I'm just going to repeat the big idea here one more time. Money is a great tool, but it's a terrible master. I am forever tempted to believe that I can serve two masters, that I can serve Jesus and I can serve money. Now, I don't, I don't usually say it like that. I don't say something like I'm going to worship money, but the reality is I make my decisions listening to the screams of money instead of the whispers of the good shepherd. And he says, you got to turn this around. No one can serve two masters. You will always experience the nature of the master you submit to, which is why, I'll say it again, you will always experience the nature of the master that you submit to, which is why if you submit to Jesus, you are going to experience peace and joy and adventure and, and, and adrenaline rushes of the spirit and hope and those senses of like something bigger is going on and that wonder, that wide-eyed sense of Jesus, what's going on, oh, Jesus. But, but when your master is money, you, you feel striving and, and stress. And when you lose a $100 pair of glasses, you, you start to really fret and yet Psalm says, fret not yourself. It tends only to trouble. <laughs> Jesus brings peace and joy and hope. See, the problem is we are, we are, since the Garden of Eden, we've been sheep. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, they did not cease listening to voices because we are voice-activated people, which is why when Adam was in the garden hiding from God, and the scripture says God came, and Adam was afraid, and how do we know he was afraid? And it says, because Adam heard the sound of the Lord in the garden. Because the Lord has a sound. The Lord has a sound. He had a sound in the garden that Adam recognized because he knew him. And it's been thousands of years now, we've lost remembrance of the sound. But when you turn to Jesus, you start to remember the sound again. You start to get the sound back. You, you get these eyes that are, that are good. And, and when you see him in the distance and, and you, start to, you start to be able to read his lips, my child, trust me. My child, believe me. Don't look there. Don't look there. Don't look left. Don't look right. Keep your eyes on me. You are a sheep, but I am a shepherd. You are lost, but I can find you. You are weak, but I am strong. Let me be your shepherd. Money is going to shout. The shepherd is going to whisper. Will you listen? Will you listen? See, no one, he says, can serve two masters. Make no mistake, you will find a master. And today I'm calling us to make it Jesus. All right, Mike, how do I apply this? Here's the one imperative of the whole passage. This is where he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Three indicatives, one imperative. The imperative, the only imperative of this passage is lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Lay them up. Mike, what should I do? Lay up treasures in heaven. Lay up the treasures, possessions, acts of service, words that we give. Lay up treasures in heaven. Mike, how would I apply this? Well, number one, I, this is my dare to you this week. Number one, I dare you to do a, a treasure inventory this week. Do a treasure inventory. Like maybe even today, maybe with your wife or your roommate or your, your friend. Or, do a put some of those up there. Do the, give me that next slide there on the treasure inventory. Pop those out for me. Number one, here are some questions um, that you might just want to write down or ask or take a picture of, okay? Where am I laying up treasures? Go, if you look at your last bank statement or Citibank statement or Visa or whatever it is, what would your bank statement tell you about where you are storing up treasures? Your bank statement does not lie. And I got, a bank, I got a statement from my bank this week that tells me, you spend this much money, you spend this much on food, you spend this much on whatever, blah, blah. I'm like, man, you could tell we have teenagers in our house because we spend money on food, okay? <laughs> Number one, where am I laying up? Number two, last time I lost something or something was broken, you could tell I wrote this for me. <laughs> How much did it crush me? All right, I got a... F on that or D minus. Number three, when money gets brought up, am I defensive or am I open? Am I peaceful or am I anxious? Number four, how much hope do I have that God is going to provide for me in the future? Number five, does my bank account show that I'm using money to love God and love people? 
Anyway, I give you those questions just as like, if you're looking, okay, what is something I can do with this sermon today? And we could put that up there. Sarah, can we make sure that's on my Instagram later? We could just have that on my Instagram as well later on if someone wants to find it there. Or maybe I'll have it on Twitter as well. Number one, do a treasury inventory. Number two, renounce mammon. Well, actually, put number three up there. Put number three. I want you to renounce mammon and announce Jesus as Lord. Like there is something, if you know that you drift towards serving money, which the, the, this, the Aramaic where there would be mammon, renounce it. Like, I mean, before you even leave, you're like, I hereby renounce mammon and I announce Jesus is Lord. You could say, that's not a big deal. No, it is. I got married when I announced Ruthie is wife. Me, husband, you, wife. That's not how he did it, but <laughs> that's how I felt. I was like, ha, oh, ha, ha, I was ready, you know? And then number two, I'll go back to number two. Give God the first. I mean, just, you know, one of the, if, you know, we've, I've had so many testimonies. I can't tell you how many testimonies I've heard when, a few years ago when Pastor Robbie was preaching on stewardship. And he talked about tithing. And I just met so many people in our church that were saying things like, you know what, I've, I never even thought of, I, I've never did it. But I started giving the first part. And guys, I have heard testimony after testimony after testimony of people that have said, you know what, Lord, I'm just going to trust you with it. Just so you know, you are going to a church. You're part of a church body. We give money to the poor, to the lost, to rescue slaves, to help those that are downcast, to reach East Gainesville, West Gainesville, unwed mothers. I need you knowing, like, even the tithe monies that you guys give, they're literally going into at-risk schools in this town. They were under-resourced. We got a letter this past week from the third grade class at Rawlings Elementary. Third grade class, Rawlings Elementary, because of budget problems, and that's a lower, you know, more of a lower-income school, they weren't going to have the money to go do their, their end-of-the-year trip. And so they were going to be able to do it. Well, of course, so they let us know about it. So, so you guys, Screenhouse, stepped in, sported the, the, the remainder of that bill so that those third graders could still go do their trip. Many kids that had never even been out of the city got to go out of the city and got to go do that. On that same day that we found out that when we began doing our like mentoring, tutoring, our work with, those, with the reading levels of the third graders, their prof- reading proficiency rates were 8%. Right now, they're just under 40%. They've gone from 8 to almost 40%. Okay. The reason I'm letting you know that is your heart's always going to follow your money. I just need you to know it. Sometimes I'm like, Lord, I want my heart to move. I sometimes just give money to our church because I know this is not just going toward pastor's salary and lights on a building. Almost 50% of everything we give is going in so many directions. I want my heart going in those so many directions. Okay? I'm, I'm, just, just pray about that. Just pray about it. if there's something God wants you to do with that. But let me end it like this. I am not going to guarantee during this series that... <laughs> that if you get generous and you get a good eye, everything is going to get better in the next 30 minutes. I, I can't promise that. But I can promise that if you get a good eye, it's going to trickle downstream. Let me read you this letter. This is to the, the epistle to Diognetus, who was a non-Christian. See, he was trying to figure out why is Christianity spreading, and this is what he said. Let me tell you why Christianity is spreading so fast. Tim Keller was writing this down. He said, Christians busy themselves on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They live in their own native lands, but they live as aliens. For every country is to them as their native land, and every native land is as a foreign country. They marry and have children, but they don't kill unwanted babies. They share their table with everyone, but they don't share their bed with everyone. They love everyone, but they're persecuted by all. They are poor, and they make many rich. They're short of everything, and they have plenty of everything. They are treated outrageously, but behave respectfully. They are mocked and blessed in return. When they do good, they are attacked. When they're attacked, they rejoice as if been given new life. <laughs> All I'm saying is, let's go be like our brothers. Let's go ahead and get back to the primitive, original recipe and say, we're going to be like them. And they were known for the good eye. They were known for this. See, see, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I think about Jesus walking down the street and and there was this guy, this blind man, this blind beggar, he's walking down the street. <laughs> and he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus is walking, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus comes up to him and he says, man, what do you want? And, and it says, even as he gets ready to come, he, he lays aside his garment. 
the only thing, the only possession he would have even had, forsakes everything. Lord's like, what do you want? He says, I want to see. See, because watch, guys. Only Jesus can give you your sight. Some of you don't even have it in you to be generous because you're still blind. Good eye, bad eye, it's out of your hands. Like you, even right now, you could just walk right out, be completely unmoved because you don't have a, a new eye yet. Only Jesus can give someone a new eye. Only Jesus can give someone a new eye. But if you'll let him, he'll give it to you. Jesus, son of David, he says, have mercy. In other words, I realize it's not something I earn, it's something I receive. It's not something I work for, it's something he earned for me on the cross where he died, where the wrath of God was satisfied. <laughs> Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Do you have a bad eye? Listen, man, probably most of us do lots of the time. But do you have a dead eye? Are you blind? Jesus will raise you from the dead. Jesus will give you new sight. Jesus will forgive your sins. Jesus will raise you up. Jesus will turn you around. Jesus will take your life and make it whole. Just let him. What do I need to do? You need to call out to him. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, Lord of lords, have mercy on me. Jesus, take my eyes. Even right now, I'm so afraid. I'm, I worry about my money. I worry about my life. I, he says, oh, little children, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. <laughs> Man, there's nothing I wouldn't do for that little human right there. And there is nothing he has not done for you. Prayer team, join me up here. Let's pray. Father, I'm asking for sight. I'm asking for abundance. I'm asking for miracles. I'm asking for your love. I'm asking for the children to act like the children that we are. Do a revival in our church, Jesus. Some of you need to give money before you go. I'm sure there's buckets somewhere. If you're like, man, I should have given earlier and I didn't, great. Take a, take a thing and you can give. That's not for me. That's for you, okay? Some of you need to go do this inventory, but some of you, you, you need something right now. You need new eyes. If you're in here and you're not sure of where you stand with God, I want you to come up to one of these before you leave and let them pray with you to get new eyes. Let them pray with you and tell you exactly where to go from here to get new sight and to come alive. If you need prayer for a healing, you need anything, they'd, be, they'd love to pray with you. But this is most of all, if you know, you need to announce Jesus as the master of your life. Come up to one of these and watch what God will do. Otherwise, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, and the Lord make his beautiful eyes shine upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come receive prayer. We'll see you next week.